Hi, it's Pastor John Adams here from First Baptist Church, Sweetwater, Executive Pastor for Administration and Education. It's my honor to teach the Bible for a few minutes for those of you who did not have the opportunity to go to Sunday school this week. And the lesson today is coming from the third chapter of the book of Proverbs, uh, focusing on the verses that begin with verse 21. This is a lesson that is entitled, Compassion Demonstrated. And it really is getting at the issue of integrity in the Christian life that really a Christian life is not real unless it's lived out in daily life. And specifically, uh, how we relate to others really demonstrates whether our faith is real or if it's fictitious. How we care for other people and how we treat the people around us. In a time uh, when there is so much going on in the world, including uh, COVID-19 and uh, great racial unrest worldwide. This is a time when Christian people need to be asking themselves some very hard questions about whether their faith is real and whether the wisdom that they're practicing is wisdom they gain from leaning on God and trusting in His Word or if it's wisdom that they've just simply dreamt, dreamt up as a part of the culture they've been raised in. These scriptures are pretty timely, and I'll try to be as uh, focused as I can on them. I'm try not to wander around too much, because I want to basically give some interpretation to a passage of scripture that I think has a lot of relevance. Let's pray. Father, this is your time, not mine, so use it for the purpose of your kingdom, advancing your love, your redemption throughout the world. Help us, Father, to look to you for wisdom and for the discretion to know how to treat people with that wisdom. Lord, help us to be real. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So how we treat others, that's the real test of our spiritual maturity. But uh, as any of us know who tries to relate to the human race day by day, loving people is not always easy. People are different from us. They look at things differently. They disagree with us on basic things in life that seem so simple for us to see and understand. And so we have to ask ourselves the question if we're going to relate to those differences as people of faith or if we're going to relate to them as just human beings. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've turned your life over to Him, there's only one option for you to choose that makes any sense. And that's the option of asking God to give you wisdom and give you the patience and the faith to live that wisdom in your relationship with other people. What makes it so difficult to love other people, especially those with whom we disagree? Ah, oh, there's so many different explanations for that. But the simple matter is that sometimes it's easier for us to be around people who agree with us all the time than it is for us to face people who have different perspective in life and to allow them to share their perspective and listen to them with respect is a Christian grace. So don't, uh, don't let you get yourself get caught up in the great American pastime of jumping to conclusions and blaming others when you have the option open to you of listening respectfully and with Christian love and try to learn from your neighbor who's different than you. Uh, so we're going to go into this verse, this passage of Scripture with a basic openness to the Holy Spirit to teach us how to relate to other people around us with compassion, with understanding, with godly wisdom. The first section of this study today is taken from verses 21 through 26 of chapter 3 in the book of Proverbs. It reads as following uh, in the Christian standard version of the Bible. Maintain sound wisdom and discretion. My son, don't lose sight of them. They will be life for you and adornment for your neck. Then you will go safely on your way. Your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down and your sleep will be pleasant. Don't fear sudden change or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from a snare. Part of what makes it uh, challenging to be around people who disagree with us is sometimes it shakes our self-confidence. 
and in our defensiveness and our attempt to try to regain our confidence, sometimes we do things and say things we shouldn't say. The writer of Proverbs says to his son, he says, son, you know, if you keep wisdom as your friend, as your constant guide in life, you have nothing to fear. Maintain sound wisdom and discretion, he said. Sound wisdom and discretion. I've seen a lot of intelligent people who have very little discretion who do not practice a sense of wisdom in the words they choose and the actions they take. They're indiscreet. Uh, they don't know when to keep quiet and when to tell the latest secret to their neighbor next door. And this is the very opposite of what God is trying to create in us and what the writer of the book of Proverbs was trying to create in his son. He's trying to create in us a wisdom that's based on what God reveals to us and how God guides us and to teach us to learn to trust that that wisdom will take us far in life. Most importantly, it will help us to stay at peace with God. And as long as we have peace with God, we'll be at peace with ourselves and hopefully at peace with the world. So maintain sound wisdom and discretion. My son, don't lose sight of them. And that's the hard thing, isn't it? To keep in focus what really helps life to fit together well. He says, they will be a life for you and adornment for your neck. Uh, it's like that the wisdom of God, when applied to one's heart as well as his head, becomes a, uh, a light for one's path and also becomes a solid place close to your heart that guides you. It reshapes your values when you let the wisdom of God be what guides you in your choices that you make. He said to his son, he said, then you will go safely on your way your foot will not stumble. Thy word is a light unto my path. Well, isn't it the truth that when you go through life without consulting with God and you don't go to his word to get wisdom, you tend to stumble along. You keep stumbling over your own feet, your own mistakes. And Solomon writes to his son, he said, you know, if you let the wisdom of God guide you and direct your thinking and your decisions, it will keep you from stumbling in life. Now, it doesn't mean that you won't make mistakes. The picture that Solomon is trying to pick, portray to his son is that if you don't have the wisdom of God guiding you, you're going to take some falls that leave you in really bad, bad condition. But the wisdom of God will protect you from the serious injuries of life, not physical, but emotional and spiritual, and will keep you on the right path toward God. Something else it does for you, not only does it keep your foot from stumbling, but it, it gives you peace of mind. He says, when you lie down, you will not be afraid. You will lie down and your sleep will be pleasant. One of the things that we've already studied in the book of Proverbs is that a key to real life and peace in life is to have your trust in God and God alone. And when you lay down at night and you begin to try to sleep, there are a number of different things that might interfere with you. One of them might be your level of adrenaline. If you've let yourself get so wound up and so excited from different things that you've watched on TV or you've personally done, you may go to bed with so much adrenaline in your system you can't get your mind to shut off. Other times you can be so fatigued, so pushed, uh, physically from too much exertion that your body doesn't know how to shut down and go to sleep. But do you know what the main cause of most of the loss of sleep in America is? It's because of minds that are not at peace with God and not at peace with themselves. And if you have the wisdom of God that is guiding you day by day and you're not trying to figure this all out on your own, you're relying to God to guide your path and to help you to be useful to him and to his work. When you lay down at night, you don't lay there worrying about everything under the sun. You don't worry about who's holding or what's happening tomorrow because you already know who's holding tomorrow. Uh, you're not worried about what's going to happen overnight because you know who has you in his arms through the night. And you're not going to worry about what, what who will provide the next meal for you because you know that your Father provides your daily bread. You've leaned into Him. You've trusted Him. So you're not worrying about the little stuff. Good principle of life is don't sweat the small stuff. The other secret is, from God's perspective, it's small, small stuff. 
So don't get wound up and worried and anxious about COVID-19 and, and about the issues in the world. Give serious consideration during your waking hours to what you can do to make this a better world, how you can serve God's purposes. But when you lay down at night to rest, turn it over to the Lord and say, you know, I believe you've got this. I'm going to just shut down for the night and let you have your world. In the, the Proverbs, the writer of Proverbs is saying to his son, it's very important if you're going to have peace of mind that you get into the daily practice. Never forget it, he said, that God is the source of your wisdom. God is the source of your hope. God is the so source of your life. And if you have that in mind and you don't forget it, you can lay down at night and not worry about things. And uh, trust me, your brain will finally shut off and go to sleep. When you lie down, you'll not be afraid. You, you will lie down and your sleep will be pleasant. Don't fear sudden danger or the ruin of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from a snare. Now, of course, when Solomon wrote these proverbs to his son and to us in our generation as we read them, he wasn't making some kind of 100% statement of truth in life. He was giving general principles to guide one's life. And so it doesn't mean that there won't be times in life when the devil lays a snare before you that you do not see in time to keep from stepping in it. But what it does guarantee you is that the wisdom, if you've been practicing the wisdom of God and leaning on the Lord, you can get up upended by the devil several times and survive just fine, thank you, with God's help. And so the principle is, you know, to trust in the Lord and that will keep your life going the right direction. It'll give you peace of mind at night and it will keep life from tripping you up. So confidence gained is always confidence gained in God, not in ourselves, but in God and God alone. That's where the true confidence must be placed. The next section of this passage is verses 27 through 30. And it's talking about us expressing kindness in relationships to other people. Look at these two verses, verses 27 and 28, what they say. When it is in your power, don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. Don't say to your neighbor, go away, come back later. I'll give it tomorrow when it is there with you. Now, of course, the original setting for this was a society in which a person went to work for anyone as a day laborer and was promised a certain wage for that day's efforts. And at the end of that day, he needed to be paid those wages so that he could go to the marketplace, pick up whatever his family need, needed to survive that night before he got up the next morning and repeated the whole process over again. And so whenever you think about that, how would it feel to be an employee who has given a day's work to your employer with the promise of a particular wage for that. And to get to the end of that day and the employer says something to you like, well, you know, you did a pretty good job. If you come back tomorrow and do another good job, I'll pay you for today. Or say something like, you know, it's been tough this week. It's been hard to get the crops sold at the local marketplace, but I'm a little short on cash. You need to give me a couple of days before I pay you. In, uh, in Solomon's world, such a thing was, was tantamount to taking away a man's food for a day and to rob him of the blanket that kept him warm at night. And so in the wisdom of God, a believer, someone who's trusting in God, is called upon to be the very best of an employer, to give to people what they have earned. Now, let's take this into the year 2020, when after many, many decades of American history, uh, people of color are having to march in the streets, attempting to get freedom that they should have had long, long ago. Freedom that should never have been taken away from them in the first place, but was likely taken away from their forebears at the end of a barrel of a gun in some African nation or other place where they were captured as slaves against their will, carried on a boat, and brought here and sold as though they were a common animal. 
And so when they come to, to us, those of us who are not of color, and they say to us, you know, you're way past due on treating us with respect and treating us as human beings. The first people who should get in line to say amen to that are people like you and me who've studied the Bible. There's no way we can excuse ourselves from showing kindness and respect and genuine justice to people of color. People are different than us. It makes no difference in the eyes of God. We all came from the same person, from the same family. And so when the psalmist, or pardon me, the, the writer of Proverbs, Solomon, is writing to his son. He's writing one of the basic facts of life, that as a person of faith, a person who walks with God, we are people who have already received justice from God, not because we deserved it, but because of his grace. And thus, the first thing we owe to humanity around us is a quick and easy payment of grace to them. As you have been freely graced by God, the only consistent thing to do is to freely grace those around you with acceptance, with love, respect, and all of the justice that is due that person. It simply is improper. It's totally wrong. It's unkind not to treat other people with respect. You could never get away with this if you thought the judgment of Christ was coming on you tomorrow because you would know exactly what your Savior would say to you if you choose not to give justice and respect to people who are different than you. And so it's best that we, even today, we begin showing respect and kindness to those around us, whether they're people of color or someone else. Kindness is, is just demanded from the person who claims to be a child of God. When it is in your power, don't withhold good from the one to whom it belongs. Don't say to your neighbor, go away. Come back, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow when it is there with you. This is the simple principle of gracing other people around us. You don't have to wait till tomorrow to give away grace. Are you aware that you can give away as much grace as your imagination can contain and tomorrow you've got an equal amount ready to give again? You can never give away all the grace that you've received from God. So don't put off till tomorrow what God wants you to give to your neighbor today. So verses 27 and 28 are really very much between the eyes at talking about expressing kindness as being the only consistent way to live as a person of faith. But it's not the only place in the book of Proverbs where how to treat your neighbor is a big deal. It's spoken of repeatedly. Let me give you some illustrations quickly. Here in chapter 3, verse 29, we're going to see that bad neighbors can betray their neighbor's trust. Wrong, wrong. We're going to see over in chapter 11, over in chapter 24, chapter 25, the principle that bad neighbors say bad things about their neighbors. This is wrong. We cannot do that as people of faith. Chapter 16, bad neighbors try to entice their neighbors to sin. Why would you go out and enlist the help of your neighbors to do something that you know would never please God? It says in chapter 21 that bad neighbors can be inconsiderate of their neighbors. A bad neighbor considers his neighbor's needs. You know, as you start thinking about why is it so wrong to play your stereo at the top decibels it'll play, it has an awful lot to do, to do with the consideration you have for the neighborhood you live in. You may have a right to play your stereo at top, top notch, but it's totally inconsiderate. It has no place in the life of a follower of God. That, that's totally wrong. And so here in the book of Proverbs, it talks about that inconsideration and how bad it is. It talks about bad neighbors lying to their neighbors, about bad neighbors being loud and obnoxious. All of that's discussed in the book of Proverbs. Sounds like it was written last week, doesn't it? Well, in reality, the Bible is talking about human beings who are always the same in every generation. Uh, you know, if you tried to turn those things around in the book of Proverbs and put them in a positive light, uh, how would you turn those statements around to make them positive? Well, one of them says bad neighbors are loud and obnoxious. 
maybe you'd want to turn it around and say good neighbors are quiet, kind, never intrusive into the personal and private life of their neighbor. If bad neighbors lie to the neighbors, maybe what you need to say is that uh, my neighbor can always trust me to tell the truth and to be a trustworthy neighbor who watches out for their property and protects it when they're gone. If uh, the Proverbs talks about bad neighbors being inconsiderate of their neighbors, it comes back to that same principle again. A good neighbor is always considerate of their neighbor. They consider their neighbor's personal comfort, personal rights, personal welfare before they take action. What kind of neighbor are you? You know, Jesus told a story about a, a good neighbor. The odd thing was, in his society, the real shock of that story was that the good neighbor was a Samaritan who was the scum of the earth to the people who heard the story. But he was a good neighbor because he saw someone in need and he considered his needs being those of his own life. And so he took that man in need and he took him for care and he provided for him until he was well again. And he ensured that his needs were met even when he could not personally be there to meet them. Jesus said, that's a good neighbor. And that's the kind of neighbor that Solomon is teaching his sons that they should be that kind of good neighbor. Well, verses 29 and 30 wrap up this section on being a good neighbor of showing kindness when it says, don't plan any harm against your neighbor for he trusts you and lives near you. Don't accuse anyone without cause when he has done you no harm. So here is a, a, a direct word of, I think, of greater value to the Christian church today than you might first imagine. Think with me a minute about what is the purpose of a local congregation of believers? Is it, is it to pay the bills? Is it to fill up their pews with people like them? Uh, is it to hand out food to those who are hungry? Uh, is it to send money so that missionaries can go and talk about Jesus in lands and places we'll never be able to go? Well, one could argue that it's about all of those things, but when you come down to the commissioning of the first body of believers, in any of the four Gospels, and in fact in the book of Acts, the commission that talks about the purpose of the people of God is all about us being like Jesus as we go into the world and tell people about Jesus. The purpose of the church is to make disciples of Jesus. All of those other things are outgrowth of a relationship with Jesus Christ and what we call an institutional church. When you get down to the basics of why the church exists, it doesn't exist to pay the bills. It doesn't exist to gather groups of people into a building. It doesn't exist to feed the, the hungry. The church exists to help people who are lost and about to go to hell find God's plan of saving their soul from sin. And that is Jesus Christ. Now, why do I get on this little tangent here? On the, Well, it's that the heart of something very important that we could easily miss here in this verse. In verse 29, don't plan any harm against your neighbor, for he trusts you and lives near you. Do you know where the mission field starts for the congregation that you're a part of? Next door to you. Next door to you. Do you know your neighbors? Do you know their names? Do you know if they know Jesus Christ? Do you know if they're engaged in somebody's Bible study and that they're a part of a group of people who are trying to become more like Christ every day? Because the, the, the edge of the mission field for the church is next door to you and to me. That's where it begins. So imagine how damaging it can be to the mission of the church if we, first of all, don't care enough about our neighbor to even know their name. Second of all, we don't care enough about them to find out 
what their spiritual condition is. And third of all, we don't care enough about them to be the best neighbor they ever had anywhere they ever lived. That is your goal and mine, to be the best neighbor anyone ever had. And that's what Solomon is talking to his son to do. He's saying, don't plan any harm against your neighbor, for he trusts you. He lives next to you. And my primary job, my first and primary job as a follower of Jesus Christ is to live in such a way next door to a couple of different families and across the street from a couple of different other families who trust me, who know that I am trustworthy because we're neighbors. And my second job is in that relationship of trust to begin sharing with them my life in Christ in hopes that God can help them to see they need a Savior just like I did long ago. This is very practical stuff. And if you fail to apply the wisdom of God and you're not careful about what kind of neighbor you are, you can see what this does to the mission field of the church. The mission field isn't over in another country somewhere. It's next door to you and me. And we have to know to share Jesus from hearts that are good neighborly hearts that love other people and are trustworthy. Don't accuse anyone without cause when he has done you no harm. Uh, it's, it's a sad thing to see the amount of gossiping that has now gotten uh, camouflaged under social media freedoms. Give somebody a keyboard today in a social media platform and they feel like that they are an anonymous critic on society. The issue is, of course, is that none of us are anonymous when we go online and we make those remarks. And when we indiscriminately accuse anyone of something that is untrue, we have automatically begun the practice of gossiping. It's nothing more than that. And the backbiting that's going on in the name of competitive politics today is something that we couldn't stand before Jesus and give an account for as Christian people. So it's very important we understand there's a principle here that you don't go around saying things about people. You don't accuse people. Accusations are for the devil to make against us against God and for Jesus to deflect with his grace. Accusations are not supposed to be a part of our culture and our world as Christians. We leave that up to the devil because it's the devil who's always the accuser. Don't accuse anyone without cause. Now, when you go to a court of law and there's a criminal action that's being taken against someone and you're having to accuse them, it best be against someone who's truly committed a crime, not just something you have a petty grievance with or disagree with politically. Don't accuse anyone without cause when he has done you no harm. How would we how would we feel if God took the same viewpoint toward us that we take against those that we accuse? If God held us to the same standard that we hold our the target of our accusations, if if that were what God used against us, would any of us stand a chance? Well the answer to that is no. We're living by grace, so we, ex we extend grace to the world. We extend grace and patience as God has done to us. The last section of this is a section called Blessings Secured. Securing a blessing from God is not an automatic slam dunk. Sometimes we act as though we think God has only one side, which is his loving, gracious side. And trust me, God is loving and gracious. We'd all be dead if he weren't. God is great love and so gracious. But God is holy as well. And when, when we assume upon the grace of God and treat people badly and unkindly, we need not expect the blessing of God on our life. But the writer of Proverbs is concerned about his son 
gaining the wisdom that it takes to live appropriately for God. So he says this, verses 31 and 32. Don't envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. For the devious are detestable to the Lord, but he is a friend to the upright. You know, I have great respect for the people who've been peacefully demonstrating in the cities of America and around the world for justice and fair treatment that they have not received and should have long, long ago. I understand that and I respect that greatly. But when hoodlums within their midst take advantage of the opportunity and begin looting the businesses of white and people of color at the same time, innocent business people who are not a part of this problem that they're protesting against. When those hoodlums begin doing that, that's evil. Don't glorify that and, and give that some kind of, well, gee, it's okay name. It's devious, it's evil, it's wrong. It's wrong in every sense to treat someone else's property that way and have no respect for the property of other people, property that they've worked hard to earn. And it's counterproductive to the whole movement of finding justice and equality. And so when this happens, um, if you happen to be a part of one of those peaceful marches that, and the writer of Proverbs were there to try to speak to you, he would say loud and clear to you to not join in with that devious action. Forgot to turn my phone off before I started taping. I should do that now. And it happens all the time. People are in peaceful protest and then some looters begin taking advantage of the opportunity and then others see people carrying off a stuff that appears to be carried off free of charge. And so Solomon reminds us of this type of thinking. He said, don't envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. Why? Well, because of how it looks from God's standpoint. You shouldn't do it because of how it appears from God's standpoint. And Solomon tells us what God's viewpoint is of that kind of activity. He said, "He the devious are detestable to the Lord, but he is a friend to the upright. My goodness, John, I thought you said God is love. What, where does that word detestable come from? Well, very simple. God detests that kind of behavior. God hates sin. If God did not hate sin, Jesus would not have had to have died. God could just have said, oh, go ahead and come on in heaven, no big deal. But in reality, there's no sin in God. He's holy, he's pure, and he understands the evil of sin in all of its different forms. And so when an evil man acts in an evil way, he sees it as the devious behavior that it is, and he, it's detestable to the Lord. But for those who choose not to participate in that kind of behavior, he is a friend to the upright. And that's what the writer is saying here to his son. He is a friend to the upright. So if you seek the blessing of God on your life, you have to live in a way that honors God, that pleases God. You can't be pleasing enough to God to be saved. You can't save yourself. But as a child of God who has been saved, who wants the blessing of God on your life every day, you have to learn to live with the values of God day by day. You choose to honor God, to obey Him. Verse 33 says, The Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked, but He blesses the home of the righteous. So again, in terms of receiving the blessing of God, Solomon is saying to his son, the Lord curses the household of the wicked, but he blesses those who seek to serve him, who seek to honor him. This is not some kind of uh, formula for success in life. This is simple wisdom, that when you choose the path of the wicked, and let's say you choose to 
gain your fortune by taking it away from other people, eventually that's going to come home to roost. That's going to come home to haunt you. That will be your undoing. It will be your death. And so that which you've chosen as your means of your quick million will become the very curse that takes you down. The rejection of God as your Savior and Lord will be that which takes you directly into a devil's hell instead of God's heaven. So the life of the wicked is a life that is cursed in every sense of the word. The Lord's curse is on the household of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. That doesn't mean financial blessing. It may, it may, and you may enjoy some financial blessings a long way, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the blessing of knowing that you are one with God and that you are in step with God and that you're living in such a way that God is pleased with you. That is the, that's the ultimate peace in life and the ultimate achievement in life is to learn to walk obediently with God. Then it says about God, he mocks those who mock, but gives grace to the humble. All of us have seen an unbeliever who has said things that mock God. You know, and he'll see you suffering and he'll say, yeah, where's your God now? And he'll mock God. And the writer of Proverbs tells his son, but God sees that clearly and he mocks those who mock him because God knows who he is and he knows his perfection and his holiness. He knows his grace and his love. He also knows his perfect justice. And so he mocks those who mock him. But to the humble, that one that is broken in spirit, that one who is aware that he has no hope apart from God and his grace, to the humble he gives grace, unmerited favor, God's riches at Christ's expense relationship with God the Father. In verse 35 that wraps up this study, the wise will inherit honor, but he holds up fools to dishonor. The wise will inherit honor, but he holds up fools to dishonor. The certain fate of fools who ignore God is to be separated from God eternally. That eternity begins now. It doesn't wait until the day they die. They're living their life in evil, mocking God, and they're living in corruption, and they're already suffering the consequences of their poor choices. In Jesus Christ, we walk in peace with God. In due time, the fools who ignore God will pay the price of their foolish choice. And in due time, those who trust in Jesus Christ, who lean fully on God's grace and forgiveness, in due time will receive their reward. On the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go... I will come back and I will receive you unto myself that you may be with me. I want you to know today that he's coming back. While it may not appear or feel as though you're being rewarded for your faithfulness yet, there is a day when you will stand before God in his splendor. He will claim you as his own. You will feel the grace that you have always felt but feel it in such abundance that it will overflow. And any sacrifice you've made or experienced at the hands of those who mock God will be long gone. The peace of God go with you. And the peace of God cause you to see life through the eyes of wisdom and faith. God bless. Have a good day.